Welcome back to PK Classics, where we honor our upline so we can inspire our downline. My name is Vance Day. I serve as president of Promise Keepers, and this is Lisa Allickson, my co-host on PK Classics. Vance, I'm excited about this program. This is so good. This is one of those you're going to laugh, you're going to cry, you're going to want your kids to see it. It's a good one. Greg Steer um, is an amazing man. He's a good friend. I just love him. And he's got such energy for Jesus. And so, you know, the interesting thing about this is, is that Promise Keepers did it a little different than a lot of other ministries when they brought the salvation message. You know, most ministries bring it at the end of a lot of build up mm -hmm. to it, and then they ask men to come forward. Not Promise Keepers. The, what they decided to do early on was that Friday night. As most of you know, Promise Keepers was a Friday night and then a pretty much all day Saturday into the mid-afternoon event. So at least on Friday night, though, Promise Keepers would bring the evangelical message, the, the message of you need to know Jesus. Hmm. Why do you think they did that? I think that they wanted men to have that opportunity right off the bat hmm. because they would at other places throughout the conference. But that Friday night, after men are singing, after men are hearing at least an initial speaker who would bring the word to them, then they wanted somebody to come up and deliver the gospel and mm -hmm. give them an opportunity to come forward and accept Jesus Christ. You know, Vance, and I... every time, Lisa, thousands would come forward. Thousands. Yeah. And, you know, I think that breathes life not only into the people coming forward, but I think as believers, sometimes we can get so stagnant and just kind of, what is our doctrine mm -hmm. and what is our Bible study? When you see new birth, there is nothing like it. And mm -hmm. we, it is so good mm -hmm. to be in a regular atmosphere where we see that. So I think it's really fun to, to watch what happens on this TV program and to watch as we pulled this out of the archives, never been seen mm -hmm. to the mm -hmm. public eye before, mm -hmm. what God did that night when Greg Steer shared the gospel. Well, and the beauty is also with this episode is that Greg Steer is one of our featured speakers at the 2020 Promise Keepers event in Arlington, Texas, July 31st and August 1st, 2020. So if you haven't got your tickets yet, you need to go to promisekeepers.org. Greg will be there. I just talked to him the other day, and um, he is so pumped. Texts me all the time. How's it going? You know, <laughs> mm -hmm. And it's going great. God's favor is upon this. Mm -hmm. So I think it's, you know one of the things that I love about Greg is he is such a good storyteller. Mm -hmm. He he, and he brings in really personal things. I and mean, his story is a little bit crazy. Yeah. Like you hear it and you go, really? But his family, his growing up mm -hmm. was not typical. Mm -mm. Not one bit. And of course he grew up in Denver and he started Dare to Share. I mean, uh, you know, you think about Greg and the ministry that he's now done for so many years, millions of high schoolers touched by his ministry and they learn how to share their faith. Mm -hmm. And so, but you know, you, you look back at Greg when he's growing up and how he shares on this episode and this message about how dysfunctional his family was. And there's so many families out there, you know, that they think that because they have dysfunction, because there was something in their life early that was traumatizing to everybody or they ended up in prison or whatever it is, that they're somehow disqualified from serving Jesus. And that is such a lie, Lisa, mm -hmm. such a lie. You know, one of the things that really encouraged me about this specific program was how Greg talks about years that he prayed for different people mm -hmm. and how they did come to Christ eventually. But I think it's like nine years and 12 years and just that hope. And I think sometimes you and I can be in the middle of, will this person ever want to walk with God? And you pray your guts out mm -hmm. for him. And to see the fruit of a decade later, yep, they mm -hmm. do want to walk with mm -hmm. God, and that's so fun to watch. And, and, and I love his encouragement to just be bold. I mean, to, to, to live life, to, to be that believer who is always ready to give a defense of the gospel, and to not be afraid to do it. I mean, mm -hmm. too many people think that because of whatever in their background that they're somehow disqualified. I mean, you think of Rahab, the prostitute, and, and how she let in the two spies and protected them, you know, in the Exodus version of, of what was happening when, when the Israelites were taking over the Canaanite areas. 
And then you look deep into scripture and she's in the bloodline of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Isn't that amazing? That God would use broken people, you know, who who literally had, had you know, they were the dregs of society and he puts them in his own bloodline. Mm -hmm. And just this last Sunday, my pastor just reminded us, you're here to bring a message to people who don't know it. Mm -hmm. You're living, this is the darkness, and someday it'll be the light. We're not in the light yet. Mm -hmm. You're the light. You take that. And it just, it, as simple as it is, almost in a childlike way, I was reminded, oh, yeah, I shouldn't be frustrated with the culture. They don't know. Like, I'm the way they can know. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that's what's so beautiful about the rebirth of Promise Keepers, that even though Promise Keepers in the last few years was kind of in a dormant stage, there is such a thirst for men to get together again, for men to worship, for men to hear the gospel message. So back to that event that's coming up, July 31st, August 1st, 2020. Bring the men. So women, if you're thinking, gosh, you know, my sons need to go. My husband needs to go. We'll buy him tickets. It's not that difficult. And get him there. So we're going to step into this message with uh, Greg Steer, who um, has the Dare to Share ministry. You're going to love it. How's everybody doing? How you doing? All right. I, I love the theme of this weekend, called out. You men have been called out by Christ, for Christ, and through Christ. Do you believe that? Yeah. And that's what we're going to be talking about. You know, I, I remember this pastor growing up who was called out, and he called out others. This guy's name was Yankee Arnold, and this guy told everybody about Jesus Christ, including my family. So grateful that he called them out. You see, I don't come from a typical religious, church-going, Bible-reading, pew-sitting, hymn-singing family. I come from a family filled with bodybuilding, tobacco-chewing, beer-drinking thugs. And that's just the women. I mean, it was, it was a tough family growing up, but one by one, my family members came to Christ and I remember when my Uncle Jack came to Christ. My Uncle Jack was the toughest one of my uncles. You gotta understand something. Three of my uncles were title winning bodybuilders. The fourth one could bench press 500 pounds. The fifth one was a Golden Gloves boxer. All right, I know what you're, some of you are thinking, well, what happened to you? I don't know. I was at the bottom of the, bottom of the gene pool. But these guys were tough. Matter of fact, the Denver Mafia knew my uncles as the crazy brothers. So when the mafia thinks your family's dysfunctional, you got some serious problems, right? But then this preacher, Yankee, called out my family one by one and saw them transformed. On a dare from a guy named Bob Daly, he went down to talk to my Uncle Jack. Now my Uncle Jack was the toughest one of all my uncles. He did hard time in prison for choking two cops unconscious who were trying to arrest him on domestic abuse charges. He was tough. He looked tough. He sounded tough. Uh, when he talked, he talked like this. He'd get right in your face. How you doing, Greg? Pretty good. How about a Tic Tac, Jack? Just back it off, right? <laughs> Tattoos everywhere. So this preacher, Yankee Arnold, comes to his door, knocks on the screen door. Jack comes to the door, no shirt on. Tattoos everywhere, ripped. He's a bodybuilder. Two beer cans, one for drinking beer, one for spit and chew. You did not want to get those mixed up. The biggest German shepherd you'd ever seen named Lobo. And he says, what do you want? And this preacher said, well, I'm here on a dare from Bob Daly to tell you about Jesus. In other words, I'm here to call you out. I'm here on a dare from Bob Daly to tell you about Jesus. And Jack said, well, I, I don't know Jesus, but I know Bob, so come on in. And for the next several minutes, for the first time in his life, my Uncle Jack heard not about religion, but about a relationship with Jesus Christ. He heard that God loved him. So much that he sent his son to die for him, that through simple faith, he could have eternal life. And when he was done, this preacher was done explaining to my Uncle Jack the gospel, he said, does that make sense? He said, hell yeah, that was a sinner's prayer, hell yeah. And he trusted in Jesus Christ, and his life was transformed, and he began to call other people out. Now, have you ever seen a new believer that's so excited that they don't know all the rules yet about loving your enemies? Well, Jack, man, he was going to bring you to Christ because if you didn't accept Jesus, he'd give you Moses right upside your head. <laughs> He's in a sauna sharing the gospel with this other bodybuilder. There's another guy in the sauna who wants to argue. My Uncle Jack 
is frustrated this guy is interrupting, so he turns and goes, hey, I'm trying to tell this guy about the love of Jesus. Why don't you shut your stinking mouth, all right? He continues to share the gospel. The guy interrupts again. My Uncle Jack says, yo, one more time. You interrupt me one more time, I'm taking you out. He continues to share the gospel. The guy interrupts one more time. Boom, Jack nails the guy. The guy falls to the ground, looks up and says, Jesus didn't go around hitting people like that. He goes, well, I ain't Jesus. I'm Jack. <laughs> Name is Jack. I'm telling him about Jesus, but I myself am Jack. Didn't know the rules. But I tell you, one by one, by one, by one, by one, all of my uncles came to a saving knowledge of Christ. My aunts, my cousins, my mom. It was powerful. They were called out. Called out by Jesus Christ himself. My family met somebody tougher. They met the Lord Jesus Christ. And you know, sometimes we don't think of Jesus as tough because we think of these movies about the life of Jesus. Have you ever seen the movie about the life of Jesus? He's always a six foot two skinny white guy. That kind of floats to the crowd and he sees you with his Jesus eyes. <laughs> Jesus was not a six foot two skinny white guy. Jew Jesus was a Jewish carpenter. Before they had power tools. These were his power tools, right? I want to see a new movie about the life of Jesus with somebody rip buff in the role. Would that be awesome? Like 30 years ago, could you imagine Arnold as Jesus? Wouldn't that be awesome? Listen to me now, disciples. <laughs> Pharisees, you will be terminated. Hasta la vista, Satan. Before he ascends in heaven, he tells his disciples, I'll be back. And there he goes. It would be awesome. Yes. That's what I want to see. And that powerful King of Kings and Lord of Lords and God of Gods is in this room tonight and he is calling you out. He's calling you out. Listen to the words of Mark in Mark chapter two, verses one through 11, where we see this in a powerful way. A few days later when Jesus again entered into Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. So many gathered there, there was no room left not even outside the door, and he preached the word to them. Some men came bringing to him a paralytic, carried by four of them. Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above him. And after digging through it, lowered the mat the paralyzed man was lying on. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven. Now some of the teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately Jesus knew in his spirit that this is what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, why are you speaking these things? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, take your mat, and walk? But that you may know, here's Jesus calling him out, that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I tell you, get up, take up your mat, and go home. He got up, took up his mat, and walked out in full view of them. This amazed everyone, and they praised God, saying, we have never seen anything like this. I love this story. Because Jesus is calling them out. Listen, and what I love about this story is not that Jesus is calling them out, but the four friends of this paralyzed man are doing what it takes to get their friend to Jesus. I wanna challenge you tonight to get to Jesus and get your friends to Jesus. Do whatever it takes to get to Jesus. Why? Because it's worth the trouble. He can heal your body. Now there are all sorts of different theological persuasions in here. But I hope that as believers in Jesus Christ, we believe that we serve a mighty God that can do anything, anytime, anywhere. I saw this personally in a very powerful way. About 12 years ago, I was in Washington, D.C. I was at a meet, gathering of national youth leaders. There were denominational heads, there were parachurch national organizations, their presidents. And we're at this multi-million dollar retreat center and we were there to brainstorm how to reach America's youth for Christ. And we had a night of prayer. And all the different groups broke up and we began to pray. There were the Baptists of one table, 
There were the evangelical free at another table. There were the parachurch guys at another table. And then there were the Pentecostals at a table. Now, I was not raised in a Pentecostal background. I was saved in a Baptist church, raised in a Bible church, preached at a non-denominational church, but I somehow got stuck at the Pentecostal table. And those of you who prayed with your Pentecostal brothers and sisters or are Pentecostal brothers and sisters know that sometimes you can be loud when you pray, right? All the other tables are quiet. Our table is loud. They are calling out to God. And the guy who's leading the circus is a guy named Bob. Now, Bob had been on TBN, CBN, you name a BN, he'd been on it. He had perfect TV preacher hair. He had gold rings. And he reminded me of Elvis. How y'all doing? And I'm like, what's going on, right? And he's like, well, we're going to pray. And he goes, what's, what's your prayer request? And the other guy said, I want to pray for a million souls to come to Christ. He goes, well, let's claim it in the name of Christ. And they started praying loud, loud, loud. And I felt really awkward because I wasn't used to praying that way. So every once in a while, I'd say, make it so, Lord, just to kind of kick in, right? Well, he's going around the table, and he's coming close to me, and they're getting louder and louder. And I'm, to be honest, like a little bit embarrassed because we're the loudest table in the room. And I start thinking, well, maybe if I pray for something personal, it'll quiet him down. He gets to me and goes, what's your prayer request, son? I said, you know what? My wife and I have been married for 10 years, and we can't have kids. That was the wrong thing to tell Bob. <laughs> he gets these crazy look in his eyes, and he goes, that's easy. I prayed for hundreds of couples. They've never failed to have kids. Gather around, boys. I'm like, oh, no, no, no. They all stand up. Surround me. Put their hand on my head, and they start screaming, Dear God, right now I pray you touch this man's sperm and bring it to life. I'm like, no, 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 no. And touch his wife's eggs and bring them together in a holy collision of life and love. I'm like, mental picture, mental picture, mental picture, mental picture. <laughs> he prays for what seems like hours. It's probably only 10 minutes. He prays for what seems like hours. He gets done. He looks at me with these crazy eyes. He goes, it is done. It is done in the name of Jesus. I go, it ain't quite done yet, Bob. Because faith without works is dead. And I don't think you could use the works for him in a prayer. Three weeks later, we found out two months later and traced it back. Three weeks later, my wife got pregnant. Thank you. I sent Bob a postcard. Dear Bob, it is done. Let me tell you something. I may differ with Bob theologically on some of the finer points. Let me tell you this. Bob prayed like Jesus was standing there. Bob did what it took to bring this request to Jesus. Listen, we got to pray like we believe God can answer our prayer. He can heal your body. Listen, even more importantly, he can heal your soul. Look at what Jesus says in Mark 2, 5. When he saw their faith, he said, Sons, son, your sins are forgiven. They tore a hole through the roof to lower their friend on the mat. And he said, Son, your sins are forgiven. Some of you came in this room tonight and you don't think your sins can be forgiven. You think you've done too much. You think you've gone too far. Or you may look at those in the world and say, well, they can't be forgiven. <laughs> years ago, eight years ago, I was preaching at a Promise Keepers in Baltimore. And nobody knew who I was, so I had to keep my speaker badge with me everywhere I went. I got in the van. They're like, this is the speaker van. I'm like, I'm a speaker. <laughs> they dropped me off. I tried to get backstage. This is only for speakers. I'm a speaker. I went to the side stage, you can't get back. I'm a speaker. I kept that with me everywhere I went. I got finished preaching, 10,000 guys, Baltimore, and we're driving in the van back to the hotel. And driving in the van back to the hotel, there was a group of lesbians protesting on the corner, protesting promise keepers. I knew they were lesbians because he had a big sign that said, we're lesbians. And I told the van driver, Lesbians, pull over. And he's like, lesbians? Pulls over. 
And I get out and I run over and I go, what are you guys protesting? We're protesting promise keepers because they hate gays. I go, I don't hate gays. And I just preached to promise keepers and I showed them a badge. <laughs> and they're like, you think homosexuality is a sin? I go, I do, but you don't. They're like, it's not a sin. I said, you know what? We could argue about that all day and we're probably not going to agree. So let me ask you a different question. Are you a sinner? Homosexuality is not a sin. No, 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 no. Have you ever lied? Well, yeah. Have you ever cheated? Well, yeah. I go, we got something in common. We both lust after women. And they were like, ha, <laughs> And the walls fell down. And I was able to share with them the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ that could look at them and say, daughters, your sins are forgiven. Listen, it's worth the trouble. It's worth the risk to get to Jesus. Now think about the risk these four friends were taking to get their friends to Jesus. Here they are, they wanna come see Jesus. They take their paralytic friend so that he can be healed. The house is crowded, so what do they do? They climb up to the roof and they dig a hole through the roof. Now you gotta understand something. I did a little research. In this culture, these roofs were one to two feet thick. There was two to four inches of clay. They'd have to break through that, and then once they broke through that, they would, they would literally have to dig through woven mats and twigs and branches. And this was an amazing thing that they did. And you know what, you think about it, they're gonna need the right tools to be able to do this. Now I want you to imagine, this is a radical thing, as radical as somebody tearing a hole through the roof right here and lowering somebody down. Think about this, you're in this meeting and all of a sudden, boom, you hear this. And then, boom, you hear it again. And then, boom. Do you think this interrupted the meeting? I estimate it took at least 20 to 40 minutes with the right tools to dig a hole big enough to lower a guy on a mat into a house right in front of Jesus. And I think I'm qualified. You know why? I was a roofer for eight years. I put on roofs, I tore off roofs. I know a little bit about roofing. And I wanna tell you something. What these guys were doing with every time they hit, it was very dangerous. Very dangerous. Roofing is in one of the top 10 uh, most dangerous occupations in America. It's a very dangerous occupation. And it was very dangerous what they were doing. They were risking their lives. They were doing what it took to get their friend to Jesus. Not only that, but they were risking their money. We don't think about this, but somebody had to fix the roof after they tore a hole through it. Not only that, they were risking humiliation. I don't know about you, but I get embarrassed on Sunday morning if I'm five minutes late and the only chairs open are the ones in the front, let alone bungee jumping from the roof into the service. They were risking rejection. They knew there was a good chance the religious leaders of their day would put them out of the synagogue because of what they were willing to do to believe that Jesus was who he claimed to be. But these friends, listen, they were willing to do what it took to get their friend to Jesus. They were gonna do whatever it took to get their friend to Jesus. Let me ask you this. Are you willing to do what it takes to break through those barriers to get your friends to Jesus? Not only that, listen. Some of you, you gotta break through barriers in your own heart. I tell these stories about my uncles that radically transformed. I'll tell you about my uncle that wasn't radically transformed, Uncle Richard. All my uncles got saved. They immediately began to tell Uncle Richard about Jesus. Richard said, hey, you guys keep it to yourself. God bless you, don't cram it down my throat. He had a religious pride. My grandpa died, Uncle Richard came up from Arizona to Denver. I was 15 years old. I was asked to give the gospel at the funeral. I gave the gospel at the funeral. A bunch of hands went up to receive Christ. I was looking at one that was my Uncle Richard to see if he would raise his hand. He did not. So I wrote him a letter the next day, laid out the gospel, best that a 15-year-old could. Sent that letter down to Arizona. Called him a week later, Uncle Richard. Did you get my letter? Yeah, I did. How's your mom? Change the subject. Shut me cold. 
My uncles began to share Christ, began to pray. He did not want to have anything to do. We could not break through that barrier. But you know what we did? We kept praying. We kept loving him. We kept sharing the gospel. We didn't care. Whatever it took, we're going to get to. We're going to break through. We're going to break through. Let me tell you what happened. Twelve years later, he came back to Denver for another funeral, his own. He had terminal cancer. He came back to say goodbye to everybody. By this time, I'm a young pastor. My uncles talk him in to go into church one last time to hear their little nephew preach. All my big uncles are sitting in the back two rows. My family, my aunts, my cousins. Uncle Richard's sitting on the end. I give the gospel. I have everybody bow their heads and close their eyes. We've been trying to break through that for years. I said, if that makes sense and you're trusting in Jesus, can you raise up your hand? With heads bowed and eyes closed, boom, my Uncle Richard raises his hand. Boom, my uncles start crying. All my uncles start crying because they were peeking down the row to see if he would believe. Three months later, my uncle went to be with the Lord, but before he did, he took a whole lot of other people with him. He told a lot of people about Jesus. Isn't that amazing? At least I love how great just brings forth to life his family circumstance and how important it is that his family persisted in prayer. I mean, you know, again and again, praying for that uncle for, you know, and that he comes to know the Lord three months before he dies. Man, they seem hmm. like a tough family, you know. <laughs> you think? Those guys can come to Christ. If those guys can think Jesus was tougher. I loved what he said about Arnold Schwarzenegger, didn't you? Mm-hmm. <laughs> how he yeah. said, I'll be back. I've never heard the comparison between Jesus and all, the Terminator, but that was really good. I laughed, but I, I think, man, if that family has that need inside, those guys Mm -hmm. that seem so tough and um, protective of their space, if God could penetrate into that the way he did, I'm just like, anybody can come Mm, to Christ. Anybody, anybody. In fact, you know, as we think about that, the event coming up July 31st, August 1st, Arlington Stadium, we've talked about it before, obviously, there are going to be thousands of men there who don't have a personal relationship with Jesus. That perhaps they grew up in the church, they were church wise, and they really, you know, they just think that, 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 oh, I'm a Christian because I was born in America and I grew up in a church. Well, the beauty is, is that our job is to invite them. Our job is to dig that hole and bring them to an event like that. And it occurs to me, Lisa, right now that there are people watching the show who, who have people on their mind who they've just been praying for for years. I know I can think of three or four family members that I have a, a friend that I know since he was since I was eight years old. He and I have been mm-hmm. friends. He doesn't know the Lord. And probably and, lots of moms with their mm-hmm. sons or even husbands, you know, to begin to pray that they would have a, a thirst for that. So let's pray right now. Let's just take a moment. Sorry to pull you out of Greg Steer's uh, awesome message. We're going to get right back to him in a moment. Let me tell you about something that there a whole group of men are doing across these United States. They've set their cell phones for 7.31 in the morning and 7.31 in the evening. A permanent alarm on their cell phones. Why? Because that signifies to them July 31st, the event, Promise Keepers, Dallas 2020. And so that when that alarm goes off, it's just a small prayer. It's just a small prayer right up to the Lord asking him to bring those men to to fill that stadium to let there be a movement that gets united or ignited but let's pray right now lisa would you join us in prayer father god we are so grateful for the people who are watching this episode of pk classics all of us have certain people on our minds who don't know you And so, Lord, we submit them to you. We bring them to the altar of your love, and we ask you to draw them to your son, Jesus. Lord, use whatever is in their lives to do that. What you allow in your wisdom, you could easily stop with your sovereign power. And so sometimes things come into our lives which are painful and difficult, but they lead us to Jesus. So, Father, we just with the audience who is watching this episode. We just lift up those people. We say their names right now, and we ask that you draw them to Jesus. 
In your son's name we pray. Amen. Okay, let's go back and catch the rest of Greg Steer's message. Let me tell you this. Let me tell you this. Some of you came in here tonight and you have never put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. I want you to listen to this. You know what that is? Listen to me. That's the prayer of your mom praying for you to come to Christ. Some of you never put your faith in Christ. You know what that is? That's the conviction of the Holy Spirit late at night when nobody else is around. You're thinking there's got to be more to life than this. You know what this is? This is the invitation of your friend who brought you here tonight. You know what this is? This is the knock of Jesus Christ. It's your life. He's trying to break through. He's trying to come in. The question is, will you respond? Listen, why should we risk everything to get to Jesus? Because he risked everything to get to us. He risked his riches and his reputation. Listen to this verse, Philippians 2, 5 through 7. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but he made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. You know what this means? That 2,000 years ago, Jesus took an ax of sorts, and he tore a hole through the roof of heaven. And that's what he did, and he descended to earth, not to be healed, but to heal us. Jesus Christ, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the God of gods, Jesus Christ himself wrapped himself in a cloak of flesh and he gave up everything. He risked his riches, his reputation. He risked his body. The Bible says that he was beaten so badly he did not even look human. That just before his crucifixion, his clothes were torn off. He was, he was chained to a stump. They took a cat of nine tails, a rod, with nine strands of leather, with broken pieces of pottery and glass and razors. They flung it into his back, his buttock, and his legs, and they ripped it again and again and again and again until his back, his buttock, and his legs were nothing but bloody ribbons of flesh and muscle and sinew. They called this beating the half death because half the guys who went on the stump died on the stump, but not Jesus. He had to finish the mission that was before him. He was that he was taken, he was mocked, his beard was ripped from his face, he was pummeled by Roman soldiers. They took a crown of thorns, two, two inches uh, long thorns, and they put it into his head, and they beat it into his head with a rod, and then beat his face with that rod. Again, he did not even look human by the time the beating was done. And then they took him up Calvary, where he was nailed on the cross, and he hung on the cross naked and twisted and dying. According to Psalm 22, all of his bones came out of joint. He hung on the cross looking at the mocking crowd. This is the King of Kings. This is the Lord of Lords. This is the one who spoke the world into existence, who holds the whole universe together by the word of his power. There's not a storm that rumbles. There's not a leaf that rustles apart from his divine command. And here is his creation crucifying him, naked, twisted, bleeding, dying for six hours on the cross. And finally, he risked the ultimate thing. He risked his closest relationship because he screamed out, Eloi, Eloi, lama sakbathani, which means my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because in that one moment, God the Father took all of his wrath and all of his anger and all of his hatred for all of our sin and he poured it out on full measure on Jesus and Jesus suffered and died for your sins and my sins and he screamed out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And in some mystic way I cannot comprehend. The father turned his back on his son. Jesus risked it all and Jesus screamed the ultimate scream of agony and the ultimate scream of victory. It is finished and he bowed his head and he died. And here's my question. Here's my question to you. Why? 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 And here's the answer to call you out. He died to call you out. He tore a hole through the roof of heaven to call you out. He became the God-man to call you out. He lived and died uh, on the cross to call you out. He had a glorious resurrection, and tonight Jesus is in this room tonight, and he is calling you out. The question is, will you heed his call? This is the most important decision you'll ever make in your life. Do you know for sure that God is your Father? Do you know for sure your sins are forgiven? 
Do you know for sure if you were to die tonight that you would be in heaven? I know for sure. Not because I'm good. I'm a filthy, rotten, dirty sinner who deserves the flames of hell. But God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Whoever believes in him will not perish, but has everlasting life. Guys, I'm not talking about religion. I hate religion. Religion comes from the Latin word that means to bind back. It's man's attempt to bind himself to God through good deeds, through ritual, through whatever. I'm talking about a relationship with God where he reaches down and he saves us. mom she was one of the ones that wouldn't trust Christ she thought she had sinned too much see I was a result of a one night stand when my biological father found out that my mom was pregnant he got transferred he was in the army he got transferred 2,000 miles away she drove from Denver to Boston to have an illegal abortion. It was before Roe v. Wade. My grandparents found out about it. They said, you come back and have that kid. We'll help you raise him. I wondered why every time my mom looked at me, she looked at me with a look of guilt because she knew she almost took my life. My grandma finally told me. My mom never knew that I knew. From the time I was eight years old, I began to share the gospel with my mom. Mom, trust in Jesus. You don't know the things I've done wrong. Again, I knew everything. My grandma told me everything. I said, it doesn't matter. Jesus died for them all. I called my mom out when I was nine, when I was 10, when I was 11, when I was 12, when I was 13, when I was 14. I'll never forget the time when I was 15. I called my mom out, Mom, Will you believe in Jesus? She was smoking a cigarette. You don't know the things I've done wrong. It doesn't matter. They're all nailed to the cross. She goes, you mean to tell me Jesus died for all my sins and all I have to do is trust in what he did for me, trust in him, and I have eternal life. I said, that's it. She took a drag. I'll trust in him right now. And in that moment, my mom was passed out of death into life. I said, where are you gonna go when you die, Ma? She goes, I'm going to heaven. Cigarettes and all. I said, Ma, heaven's not smoking, but yes. <laughs> Let me tell you something. Eight years ago, I buried my mom. People ask me today, how's your mom? I said, she's doing fine. She's in the presence of God. I want to tell you this. Listen to me. Listen to me. Listen to me. Jesus tore a hole through the roof of heaven to get to you. The question is, will you say yes? I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes. Every head bowed, every eye closed, no one looking around. Here's my question to you. Jesus is calling you out tonight. Will you put your faith and trust in Jesus? It's not by being good. It's not by going to church. It's not by being religious. It's by simply believing that Jesus died for you on the cross and trusting in him and him alone. And as soon as you do that, Jesus said in John 6, 47, I tell you the truth, if you trust in me, you have everlasting life. It's not a matter of trying harder. It's a matter of simply trusting. Not trying, but trusting. It's not turn or burn, try or fry, it's believe and receive. If you trust in him, you receive that gift of eternal life. So right now, right where you sit, will you put your faith in Jesus? Will you receive that gift of eternal life through faith alone? If you're doing that, you can express that faith in your heart to God through this simple prayer. Just say it silently in your heart to God with me. Dear God, I'm a sinner. I messed up. I fall short. 
I can't be good enough. But I believe that Jesus died for my sins. I believe he rose again. And I trust in him right now to forgive me for all my sins. To give me eternal life. Thank you for this free gift. With heads bowed and eyes closed, my friend, if you just put your faith in Jesus, you are saved. You're saved from hell. You're saved from a wasted life. You're forgiven. You have a new daddy. He'll never leave you or forsake you. And I want to be the first one to welcome you into the kingdom of God. So with every head bowed and every eye closed, no one looking around, if tonight that message made sense for the very first time and you trusted in Jesus, you received that gift of eternal life. With heads bowed and eyes closed, can you simply raise up your hand? Wow, keep your hands up, keep your hands up, wow. Everybody keep your heads bowed and your eyes closed. Those of you, just those of you who are raising your hands right now, I want you to look at me, just look up at me, okay? Just those who are raising your hands. Those of you who put your faith in Christ for the very first time, I want to welcome you to the family of God. You've been born again. You've been passed out of darkness to light. And now, listen, I'm going to call you out. I'm going to call you to take a public stand. Not because you have to to go to heaven. If you put your faith in Christ, you're saved. I'm going to ask you to take a public stand because the men in this room, they want to affirm you. They want to celebrate. So I want you to come forward right now if you raise your hand. Come on down. Jesus is calling you out. He's calling you to the aisle. Come on. Come on out. Come on down. Don't be ashamed. Look at this. Look at these guys. If you put your faith in Christ, come on down. Come on. Come on, everybody. Give them a hand. Come on down here. This is the best decision of your life. Give them a hand, guys. Look at this. Don't be ashamed. Just come on down. Right down here. Right down here. Look at this. There's a party in the room. There's a party in heaven in your honor. Welcome to the family of God. Come on down. Come on. Look at this. If you put your faith in Christ tonight, let us celebrate. Let us celebrate with you. Don't worry. This, this is Jesus pounding through the roof of heaven to get to you, all right? This is yours, all right? It's a reminder of this weekend. Please don't wield it. Just hold on to it. Praise God. Okay. The evangelism team is going to come out. Listen, I think there's may, there may be more of you. Put your faith in Christ. You know what I love about this story? The paralytic couldn't get to Jesus by himself, so four friends took him. Some of you are paralyzed in fear. Maybe you trust the Christ in your heart, you're saved, you're in. But this is a way for people to celebrate with it. This is a first step to, to your baptism. Because that is a public proclamation of an inward transformation. This is a first step to that. Baptism doesn't save you, but man, it is a way to say, everybody, I am saved. So listen, listen. For those of you who are paralyzed in fear, a friend had to take him down. Some of you in this room, just turn to the person next to you and say, Will you go down with me? I mean, maybe you're saved already, but would you want to come down with me? Have you put your faith in Christ? And just like those four friends took their paralytic friend, your friend will take you down. So if that describes you, just turn to the person next to you and say, do you want to go down with me? Just turn. Use words. This is not miming. Turn. Use words. You want to go down with me and just bring them down. If they're here, they're ready to put their faith in Christ.
got some more guys coming down. Let's give God a hand. Amen. Just turn to the person next to you. Look at this. Bring them down. This is it. Praise God. Come on down. As you guys make your way down, I want you to understand something. Those of you down here, saying a prayer doesn't save you. Walking an aisle doesn't save you. Jesus saves you. But now, turn, you guys who came forward, turn and face the crowd. Now, these guys, they know you're in. Now, these guys, they're going to pray for you. You go to church with some of these guys, they're going to disciple you. They're going to explain this whole Christian thing to you. Yeah, we have counselors out here. You'll see them with the EV tags. They'll help you understand some of the basics. Hang around and talk to one of them. But the person that brought you tonight, they're going to help you grow in your faith in Jesus Christ. Welcome, welcome, welcome to the family of God. Amen? Wow. I got to tell you, I just... I love how Greg just presses in and makes it so real that, you know, the Lord works through us. Yeah, he that, chooses to do that. That whole acts thing mm -hmm. of just hearing that hit. This is your mom praying. This is your buddy bringing you. This is God pursues us. Mm -hmm. He is so faithful to do that. And, you know, the one difference between this, you know, seeing Greg up on that conference doing it many years ago and today is is I cannot imagine anybody on the stage handing an axe to an unknown person <laughs> and saying here's a souvenir for you buddy oh don't whack anybody I mean <laughs> yeah. not in today's terrorism um, it's just it was funny I was watching that um, but I love how he used that prop mm -hmm. this is your mother praying yeah. this is you know this this is yeah. the, you know it and it really reminds us of how important it is that we're conscious at all times to the work of the Holy Spirit through us to meet the needs, the, the salvation needs of those around us. Mm -hmm. That the Lord's always about that. Yeah. As a mom who's praying for a specific son, that just blessed me because I thought, I'm making a dent. I can't feel it. I can't see it. But, you know... I if it's nine or 12 years, I'm good with that, really. Mm -hmm. I just want my sons to know Jesus loves him. And how Greg just talks about, do whatever you have to do mm -hmm. to get to mm -hmm. Jesus. And I, I also was really impacted by, you remember when he was talking about his mom? And that he kept sharing. He was even mm -hmm. like a little guy, you know, telling his mom. And his mom was like, I've done too much. Mm -hmm. And just not feeling like God would be willing to overlook her great big pile what felt to felt to her and mm -hmm. you know i i've made so many mistakes in my own life and to come to a place where just between god and i to know that he really did know about that and he really does love me he wants me to agree with him about it that it was wrong but it doesn't doesn't matter what we've done. He would hold our face in his hands and he would look in our eyes and he would say, I love you. Mm. You know, I love how my friend Bob Cornuke puts it. You know, two men, you, 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 you look at those two thieves who are on either side of Jesus Christ. Two men equally close to life. Two men equally close to death. And their reactions to Jesus are exactly what our culture is reacting. One mocks and the other accepts. Mm -hmm. And that one who accepted, I mean, there he is at the end of his life, a sinful life. And Jesus says to him, you will be with me in paradise mm -hmm. tonight. I mean, that, that is amazing to me. Mm -hmm. We have to remember that, that no matter the relationships we're in, no matter where we are, no matter who we're with, 
that people need to hear the gospel. And, you know, Roman says that we know intuitively that there's a creator God. It's written in the fabric of our heart. It's written on the tabula rasa of our soul that there is a creator. But Jesus has to be preached. Jesus, we have to tell the gospel story. Mm -hmm. Wasn't it interesting, Vance, when Greg had shared that you could come forward and receive Christ? And then a little while later, he said, are there any people out there that Mm. you would come if somebody came with you? Mm Mm-hmm. You know, or, or say to the guy standing next to you, do you want to go up if I would go with you? Mm-hmm. And the power of that, I know there have been times in my life is, um, when some brother or sister said, you can do this and I'll do it with you and I'm not leaving you. And I think that's um, just, th- there aren't even words for how powerful that is. Vance, you have had an opportunity in your life, a really unique opportunity to get to know some of the men involved in the HBO series, Band of Brothers. Mm -hmm. And it's one of my personal favorites. I've always liked (laughs) war movies better than chick flicks, I guess. It's why I'm good for (laughs) men's ministry, maybe. But could you share a little bit about that real Band of Brothers and Mm. through the years, how they were connected and what knowing them and their story, how it's impacted your life? I appreciate that opportunity to talk about that, Lisa. It, it, there was a, a time in my life where probably 10, 11 years where I had the opportunity to travel with the original Band of Brothers. Um, I was trained as a historian and as a history teacher. And before I went into uh, the legal field as a lawyer and a judge, um, I just I love history. And I was reading that Band of Brothers book and I was actually praying about it. I'd love to meet these guys. Really? Yeah. And I don't have any business, Lisa lecturing on leadership at the White House, giving, you know, talks at West Point or, you know, on different shows, except for my relationship with Don Malarkey, Buck Compton, Dick Winters, mm-hmm. all of those guys who were part of the Band of Brothers. You know, it's interesting because you, Greg talked about, you know, do whatever you can to bring somebody to Jesus. And sometimes that's just living next to them and enjoying them and being a light. You know, Buck Compton, for example, became one of my very closest friends, as well as Don Malarkey. Hmm. I love those two men. And, you know, Buck, here he is. He's a, his father committed suicide at age 16. You know, it devastated his life, but he was an athlete south, you know, Los Angeles. And he he went to UCLA on a football scholarship and a baseball scholarship. His roommate was Jackie Robinson, you know, as they traveled, because Buck didn't have any problem, you know, rooming with the black guy, and they were close friends. Buck was the starting guard on the 1943 Rose Bowl um, team, UCLA, against uh, Georgia. And then he gets on a troop train a few days later, and he becomes a paratrooper lieutenant, jumps into D-Day, wins the Silver Star, Purple Heart in Holland, surrounded by the Germans for nine days. You know, he went into battle with Don Malarkey, Mm-hmm. He had a summer uniform on, so did Don. Don had no bullets, and Buck had two clips with eight bullets each, and he handed one to Don, and that's how they went into combat. Mm-hmm. Those guys went through hell. And here Don Malarkey and Buck Compton, you know, is in their in their 70s and 80s. I got to know them. Mm-hmm. And, you know, Buck, and I don't want to get too long into this story, but he really impacted my life. Because he became a lawyer and then a prosecutor, and then Governor Reagan put him on the Court of Appeals of California after he convicted Sirhan Sirhan for the murder of Robert Kennedy. And so there were nights where Buck and I would just talk about stuff, just you know, legal theory, and we'd stay up late on my deck just talking about these things. And one day when he was 86 years old, we're sitting at my kitchen counter, and he just turns to me and he says, can I just come to know that Jesus, you know? I mean, I got to tell you, I, I love that guy with a full heart. And here he was at 86 years old, asking me to help him understand who Jesus was. Mm-hmm. That's what Greg's talking about. When we live life next to people and they see the Jesus in us, I'm nothing special. But man, it was such a blessing mm-hmm. to just say, Buck, it's not hard. It's real simple, and I just walked him through the process. Vance, 
after he had been so specifically impacted through war and doing life and surviving that war with men, and they talk so much about their bond and how mm -hmm. they covered each other's backs. How did that connection with you, as he entered in now to a faith journey, did he stay connected to you? Did he lean oh, on you closer. the way he did? And it was interesting, the relationship flipped a little bit because I became more of the mentor for him where he had mentored me. Hmm. And he was the one who encouraged me to be a judge. Really? And yet, and he shows up at my investiture and then two months later he went to heaven. But I'll never forget those little, you know, hands of his big meat cleavers raising their arms to Jesus. That's the beauty of walking with other men mm -hmm. and leading them to Christ. So we just encourage you as you think about Greg Steer and Promise Keepers and, and the message that Greg brought today. Don't be afraid. Be bold. Dig the hole through the roof for those you love. We we'll look forward to you joining us again on PK Classics where we honor our upline so we can inspire our doubt. And for victory. So that from Alaska to Florida, your will, not our will, as it is done in heaven. So that people see not us, but they see Christ in our actions. We're going to start to lift up our pastors. We're going to start to stand in the gap for our preacher. We're going to pray around the clock. We're going to build these men up. We need great leadership. Let's rally them. Let's ignite them. We can change the spirit of this nation. We must represent together a new spirit for the world. You have been called from being a slave to the devil to being a slave of Jesus Christ. We are somebody because we've been redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. Child of the King! I am now a member of the family of God! The greatest thing that can happen is for Christians to rise up and take this country for Christ!